Here you go, the one you've been waiting for, the story of the Ojai Coupe, a 1932 Ford five-window coupe with a chop top and a 1934 Ford flathead motor. How did it get from a dairy barn in Fort Worth, Texas, then travel all the way to Ojai, California, then travel all the way across the United States to end up in East Tennessee, of all places, right here at Puddin' Creek Rod Shop? Well, that's the story I'm about to tell you. The first time I saw the car was when the guy with the Instagram handle, Barn It Up, posted this picture of it on Instagram. This was back in 2020. He had found the car in a dairy barn in Fort Worth, Texas. It had a flat firewall and a birdhouse cow vent and looked like it had been set up with double master cylinders for a hydraulic clutch at one time. It had a bunch of flat tires covered in barn dust and a tractor parked in front of it. I mean, that's just the way you want to find them. I remember thinking, wow, what a great find. What a lucky guy. Never dreaming that years later, the same car would end up in my shop in East Tennessee. I also remember thinking it's a channeled car like an old 50s hot rod, but also it looks like it has orange plexiglass windows like a gasser. So I was a little confused as to exactly what it was. It had a set of 1950 Buick taillights and had the gas tank relocated to the trunk with a hole chopped in the quarter panel and the gas tank neck sticking out of the quarter panel like a race car. One of the coolest things about it is it had a full set of old chrome window garnishes. Again, kind of a 1950s hot rod touch. So that, combined with the 50 Buick taillights and the body being channeled down over the frame, tells me 50s hot rod. The orange plexiglass windows tells me gasser. I'm confused. How about you? It also had a cool old set of white bucket seats. I'm guessing 1960s. But these seats were long gone by the time the car makes it to Puddin' Creek Rod Shop years later. Now, barn it up, he pulled it out of that dairy barn and hauled it back to his shop, and he did some work to the car. Looks like he installed a small block Chevy with a tunnel ram and two fours. But at some point, he must have got tired of working on it or had too many projects, and he put the car up for sale. And guess who bought it? My friend in Ojai, California. The 32 is heading off to California. Not in this truck. Barn it up sure has the coolest rollback. Give him a follow on Instagram next time you're on there if you don't already. He's always finding cool cars. So a shipping company picks up the 32 Coupe and hauls it all the way to Ojai, California, where it lands in my friend's driveway. My friend inspects the car when it arrives and finds out that the frame is really trashed. It's beyond usable. So he starts looking for a good, solid, original 32 Ford frame and a flathead motor. You see, my friend is not really into small block Chevys and tunnel rams. He's more of a traditional hot rod guy. In the meantime, he starts taking the car down to bare metal. That way he can see what he's actually got to work with and what repairs are going to be needed. After a few bum leads on original 32 Ford frames, he makes an amazing find. He finds an all-original 1932 Ford chassis with a 1934 flathead motor in it and a 39 transmission, and the chassis's already been changed over to juice brakes. It's got 1940 Ford brakes all the way around, and the brakes even still work. So my buddy sets the five-window body on the cool chassis he just found and ships the whole mess out to the twins for a haircut, for some rust repair, and a brand-new floor pan. Now, in these pictures, you can see they have the top chopped, but they haven't welded the tops of the doors back on yet. You can also see they did some rust repair on the lower parts of the body, and they filled the taillight holes where the 1950 Buick taillights were. So they get the top chop finished, they make wood templates for all the glass, and also they weld in new rear fender wells. Wow, check out that profile. 
She sure looks mean now. What a transformation these guys did. The twins do great work. They put brand new sub rails and a brand new floor pan in it. And do you notice something different? It's not channeled anymore. Now it's a high boy. Much better. So the twins have done their magic and the car gets shipped back to my friend in Ojai, California. Now my Ojai buddy, he's like a lot of your hot rod buddies. He's got several projects going all at the same time, and he's completely out of storage space. So he had to rent this storage facility to keep the 32.5 window in. So every week when I talk to him, he's telling me how crazy the storage fees in California are. And I'm telling him how a 32.5 window is my bucket list hot rod. So the day finally came, and he said to me, if you want the 5 window, I'll sell it to you for exactly what I've got in it. And I said, I'll take it. So I call up my buddy Ben D. You guys know him from the ham. And I say, you wouldn't happen to be anywhere near Ojai, California, would you? And he says, I'm making a run toward the West Coast right now. I'll be there in a few days with an empty trailer. So I tell him to pick up the Ojai Coupe. And slowly he starts back across the country with it toward East Tennessee. So our buddy Ben, the car hauler, he shows up just as the sun's starting to go down one night, and we push the Ojai Coupe out of his trailer, and we stop to snap a few pictures before we push it into the shop. Now, if you guys were here helping me unload this car, you'd probably ask, hey, Puddin' Creek, what's the first thing you're going to do to it? Well, the first thing I'm going to do to it is get rid of that cheap Chinese Speedway Motors V-shaped front spreader bar. Now, it just so happens I have an original 32 Henry Ford front spreader bar that's a little rough and crusty, and that's kind of the look we're going for on this car. This car's not going to be a highly finished, painted street rod. This is going to be a sweaty old hot rod. So I get it inside the shop. I pull up a stool and just look at it a while. It's really hard to believe that my bucket list car is sitting right here in my shop and ready for me to get started on. After gawking at it for a while, I dig around in my parts pile and find a set of dog dish mercury hubcaps. Slap those on there. Boy, that sure rings the satisfaction bell with a minimal amount of work. The next morning, I'm just itching to get at it. The first thing I want to do is see if I can get this flathead running. It still has the old original 1932 Ford wiring harness laying on it. So I downloaded a wiring diagram and I want to see if I can hot wire this thing and make it turn over. So I get it hot wired, and the little woman shows up to film the big occasion to see if the flathead motor's going to start or not. You guys all cross your fingers for me. I'm going to need all the luck I can get. Wow, it fired first time. Now you're saying to yourself, hey, Puddin' Creek, that thing sure fired awful easy. This kind of smells like a setup. No, it's not a setup. It's just this is not a flathead motor that's been out in a field for 40 years and full of bird nests and rat droppings. This, I think, is a running, driving chassis that was pulled out from under a car, probably by a street rotter, to put a new aftermarket chassis underneath the car. If you're a traditional hot rod guy, the street rotter is your best friend because the street rotter wants to pull out the original motors and chassis and put in new aftermarket stuff they order off the internet. And that's where we find a lot of our good parts to build traditional style hot rods. Well, I've got it halfway idling now by bottle feeding it. If I could just talk the little woman into sitting up on the cow and bottle feeding the carburetor, we could take it for a test drive. Okay, now who stole my gas bottle? Who's the wise guy? <laughs> and here we go. Making an old flathead motor run, that's just about as good as it gets. When I got the car, it had a really nice original Henry Ford grill shell on it. But it was painted red oxide primer. I hate primer on a hot rod. Don't you? 
So it was about this time that my friends, the Barrelero brothers in Knoxville, Tennessee, posted up this original 32 grill shell with a little bit of original black paint still left on it and a really cool patina for sale. So I drove down to Knoxville, made a deal with them, brought it back, and now it's on the Ojai Coupe. Now that's much better. So I know there's a couple of you guys out there are running to your computer to send old Puddin' Creek an email and say, hey, I want to buy that grill shell that you took off. Well, before you do that, I'll let you know I've got a 32 sedan with a Buick Nailhead motor in it that was needing a grill shell. And it's black primer, so it don't hurt my feelings to put a red oxide primer, original Henry Ford grill shell, on the front of it. Now, the front of the car was looking a little sparse with no headlights, and boy, have I got the headlights for this car. I've been saving these headlights for a long time. They were being saved for my bucket list car. So here we go, a set of E&J 1920s and 30s accessory headlights. These came on a lot of really high-dollar cars in the 1920s and 30s. They were an accessory light. They were also famous for being on the Fred Mack Roadster. Good googly moogly. Whoever designed these headlights in 1925 were way ahead of their time. So I get the headlights mounted up, and I sit down to eat my lunch. And as I often do while I'm eating lunch, I flip through one of my collection of 1950s hot rod magazines. Today it was 1956. Now in this issue of Hot Rod Magazine was an article on Reuben Shanneman's Caddy-Powered T-Roadster. Well, the first thing I noticed are these crazy air scoops on the Caddy motor. My instant reaction are these are some wicked air scoops. I've never seen anything like these before. Nobody's running these. But after looking at them for a second or two, I think, hey, these look a lot like something I've got in my parts pile. The Offenhauser Remote Air Scoop. I think these air scoops were designed to put under hood and run a piece of ductwork to them out to a cold air vent somewhere in the front of the car. My deep dive on air scoops from the 1950s is interrupted by the UPS man. He shows up with the new Stromberg carburetor for the Ojai Coupe. So let's take 10 minutes and get the new carb on there. I get the new carb mounted up and my thoughts turn back to these 1950s custom air scoops. I decide right then and there, the Ojai Coupe has to have one. I drop everything and get busy making one. The best I can tell from this old black and white photo, it looks like they rotated the scoop over on a particular angle and then machined off all the front of it, the part that the uh, duct work or the piece of hose would attach to, which leaves a real aggressive looking mouth on the scoop. I had this cone shaped aluminum casting that came off of a piece of industrial equipment that I machined up to make an adapter to go between the new Stromberg and the Offenhauser scoop. I also polished up the scoop, painted the inside maroon. Now it's looking like something. I'm totally satisfied with this. I've convinced myself the new air scoop will add at least 20 or 30 horsepower to the old flathead motor. What do you think, guys? Let's back it out in the daylight and see what it looks like with the new scoop and the new headlights and the patina grill. The next order of business was a hood. Now I had an original Henry Ford hood it had a pretty cool patina on it, but it looked like it'd probably been run over by a tractor or a fork truck or a dump truck or a high loader. It was pretty flat. It was going to need a lot of shape put back in it to ever fit on the 32 cal. So I started hand forming the hood around a six inch piece of steel pipe slowly and taking masking tape to mark everywhere the bend needs to be so I know what angle to put the bend in the hood so that the bend lands in the correct place on the cowl and the correct place on the grill shell. So after about two hours of bending and my shoulders are good and sore, it's looking pretty good. It's not half bad. Matter of fact, it's looking good enough that I need to stop doing this and put the cowl lacing on the cowl and the, and the lacing on the grill shell in order to get the hood setting at the proper height so I can finish tweaking it in and get a perfect shape. To cut your cow lacing, nothing works any better than these hose cutters that use a razor blade to do the cutting. Get you a pair of these and you'll get nice clean cuts on your weather stripping, cow lacing, and on hoses. Now putting the holes in your cow lacing for your rivets to go through, that's a big problem. 
Uh, if you try to drill it, of course, it just grabs and tears the cow lacing all to pieces. If you try to punch it with a punch, it smashes the cow lacing. Here's the best way I've found to do it. Just take an awl, heat it up, and you can push it straight through. It kind of sears the hole, makes a nice, perfect hole for your split rivets to go through. I always bend the split rivets in completely closed to make them a lot easier to go through, and then you can just spread them right back out. I just use a chisel to spread the split rivets back apart once you get them through the cow lacing, and then just a hammer and punch to flatten them out. Well, there's the finished product, nice and neat. Now let's get it installed on the grill shell. If you want your cow lacing to fit nice and tight, here's another trick for you. Instead of trying to make it long enough that you can pull it tight by hand and hook it, Make it the correct length, make it just short enough so it fits nice and tight, then take a piece of wire and a pair of vice grips, hook onto the bottom hook, that gives you a lot of pulling leverage. Pull it down super tight and hook it, and then you can just pull the wire out when you're finished. Works like a dream. And here's how it's supposed to look. Nice and neat, nice and tight, fits great. Now let's move to the other side, get it knocked out, do the cowl, and we're done. The cowl lacing gets the exact same process. Clips, vice grips, wire, when you're doing this on your car and your hot rod buddy says, wow, that's kind of a hillbilly way to do it, you say, well, I learned it from one of Puddin' Creek's videos, so there's that. As I was working on the grill shell, I kept knocking the radiator cap off. Why? Because this car has a nice Walker radiator with a relocated filler neck that's out under the hood. So there's nothing to hold the original radiator cap in place. It was just sitting there. So I decided to make an adapter to mount it up permanently so it wouldn't be falling off anymore. Now I'm gonna make this adapter out of aluminum and I'm gonna machine it on my NOS 1972 Craftsman lathe. If you hadn't seen the video on that, go over to our channel and check that out. So here's the aluminum adapter I machined. And here's the radiator cap all disassembled. And here's the whole thing bolted together in the grill shell. Now the radiator cap's bolted down permanently, no more falling off, and we can mark another job off our list. Now I know after getting the cowl lacing on, I was supposed to get back on forming that hood and fitting it up. But doggone it, I'm getting itchy to drive this thing. And I don't need a hood to drive, but I do need a windshield. So I took the wood template that the Mingus twins made years ago to our local glass shop and had them cut a windshield for this thing. Now this windshield gets sealed up with window setting tape. I use electrical tape to hold the window setting tape in place until I get it into the windshield frame. Now a 1932 Ford windshield frame is actually larger at the top than it is the bottom. So you have to spread the bottom a little bit to get the glass in. The way I do it is with a porta power. I just barely crank it open at the bottom. I test fit it with the wood template. And when I get the wood template going in real nice, then I move on to the glass, slip the glass in, let the pressure off the porta power, and you're done. Now here's what I'm talking about. Now we can cruise without getting bugs between our teeth. Now when I got this car, it had a really old set of date coated tires, and they were all four the same size. That'll never do for a hot rod. So I ordered a set of bigs for the back and littles for the front. Firestone Champion by supplies. Now we're ready to ride. So you're sitting in your living room watching this video and your wife says to you, has old Puddin' Creek lost his mind? Why is he taking the body off that car? He just got it running and driving. 
Well, that's the same thing the little woman said to me when she popped her head into the shop. Why are you taking the body off this car? You just got it running and driving. Well, let me tell you why. Well, the test drive went so good that I got excited about getting some tags and some insurance for the car and getting it out and driving it some. It's still summertime. I could get it out and play with it just like it is. And then this winter, I could tear it all apart and do all the serious work that needs to be done to it. That was my plan. Here's the problem. This car never had a title. And the VIN number that's normally located right around the steering box area stamped into the frame, it's not visible. So I decided to pull the body real quick and hope that the number that's stamped into the top of the frame above the rear axle is still visible. Well, sure enough, I get the body up in the air and the rear VIN number stamped into the frame nice and legible. I take that VIN number and I apply for a title but that's gonna take a while. So in the meantime, while I'm waiting on a title to come in, I decide to roll the chassis outside and pressure wash it, get it all cleaned up real nice. When I get the chassis all pressure washed and degreased, I see that the chassis is in amazing condition. It's really nice. But the K member, that's another story. It looks like someone has took a torch and hacked it all up in order to put a larger transmission in at one time. Then I guess they changed their mind, decided to go back to a Ford transmission, and welded all those pieces back in. Now in my park stash, I have a mint condition, original, 1932 Ford K member. You guys can see where this is going. I really wanted to cruise this car this summer, but I just can't be out cruising with a little woman and a K member that's as dangerous as this one. So, bright and early the next morning, I unlocked the Puddin' Creek Rod Shop, and I set about tearing the whole chassis apart. Step one's going to be to get these friction shocks off so I can get the rear end removed. So we get the friction shocks removed. We unbolt the spring clamps from the spring and the rear cross member. We jack the frame up a little bit to dislodge the spring out of the rear cross member. We unbolt the torque tube. Then we're able to pick the rear end up by the torque tube, roll it out from under the chassis, and park it out of our way. Now the K member is held in place by a whole slew of rivets. Step one is going to be to hit those rivets with a grinder, just so we can see them real clearly, because we need to center punch the exact center of the rivet before we start drilling. After center punching, then we drill out the rivets. Once the core of the rivets are drilled out, then you can use an air hammer to drive the rivets out of the holes. Once all the rivets are removed, the K member should knock right out of the frame. And it's loose. You can see in this picture where they really hacked it up to add the 39 brake pedal assembly. Now that we've got the frame cleaned up and degreased and the K member removed, I can see that there's a few spots that are gonna need some repair. No big deal, we'll fix all those. Let's walk over here and take a look at how bad that K member really was. When you lay the two down in the floor side by side, Man, you talk about butchered up. I'm really glad we decided to go ahead and pull that one out and put the nice mint original one back in its place. It's gonna be much safer, it's gonna be much nicer, and it just needs to be done. Now that night, I found an ad on Marketplace for a 40 Ford rear end, a 40 Ford front axle, and four 40 Ford wheels with tires. So we loaded up the next day, me and a little woman, and headed to the sketchiest part of the mountains that you've ever seen to try and buy some 40 Ford parts. We're driving along this long, winding, gravel, mountain driveway, and on both sides of the driveway, we see dead trucks parked all along the path. Then we get to a certain point in the driveway where we cross a bridge over a creek, and we see where they've been riding a jet ski in the creek. As we get a little closer to the house, we come upon this friendly sign. So would you turn back or would you continue on to get your hot rod parts? Let me know in the comments. Well, we made it out alive. It was sketchy, but we made it. 
We bought a 40 Ford rear axle, a 40 Ford front axle with the backing plates, and four 40 Ford wheels with tires for $700. So you guys tell me if I got a good deal or not. So looks like the Ojai Coupe is getting a 40 Ford rear end now. Well, that's all for this week. We sure appreciate you watching our videos. Be sure and subscribe if you hadn't already. Tell your hot rod buddies about Puddin' Creek Rod Shop. Thanks again.